Listening to Cross Rhythms, Community Matters, and I'm your host, Ian Pilkington, joined in the studio today uh, by someone who's becoming a good friend. I hope I could say that. <laughs> Tracy White. Hi, Tracy. Hi, Ian. And um, Tracy is a, well, I'll frame it this way and then we can reframe it because I think that's going to be what the whole thing's about. Yeah. Uh, Tracy is a mental health practitioner, but then we'll stop there and say that we're going to reframe that uh, with uh, quite a lot of experience in the city helping people out of some very complex situations to find mm -hmm. an authentic way through to life. And I'm not going to try and put words on it because I'll let Tracy, I'll let you speak because uh, your whole story and your whole journey is going to uh, help us with that. So mm -hmm. a little bit unusual for Community Matters. We're going to be on a bit of a ramble today around this topic, but then it's a topic that needs to be gently and thoughtfully um, unpacked. And uh, I can't think of a better way to do this than to have a chat with you, Tracy. So um, introduce yourself a little bit. What's your experience in the city, in this whole area of uh, people's brokenness? Okay. Oh, how to do a potted version of that. Yeah. Um, so I've been a mental health uh, patient myself. I've been diagnosed with different mental health or mental illnesses and lots of medications. Um, so very troubled um, some years ago now. Uh, and that didn't... There was just a little bit of hopelessness, or a lot of hopelessness in most of that for me. Um, though I, I bore with it because it was all that had, and I was a Christian at the time. Um, I was an alcoholic when I came to Christ, and that didn't stop immediately. So, um, uh, But as that lowered, the mental health challenges grew, <laughs> mm. um, just because they started coming to the surface. Mm. Um, and I got to a point where I was very, very hopeless within the mental health system church didn't seem to quite know what to do or kind of how to help and did lots of things around um, praying with me and lots of ministry and things like looking at the enemy's effect in our lives and scripture and all of that stuff um, and very well-meaning people but nothing changed um, so that kind of added for me as a person in the church added to my sense of my failure I didn't have the faith I was getting it wrong um, and it just came to a very turning point where I thought, I'm done, I can't do any more. And various ways, God picked me up and um, I kind of ended up saying, OK, Lord, mm. I, I'll surrender my desire to not be here anymore. I'll surrender it for a year mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I'll see what happens in that year, trusting you to do something. Yeah. Um, and then God just started to work on some deeper issues in my life mm. that was unresolved trauma, really, unresolved distress unresolved, unmet needs from the whole of my life. Mm. Um, and it wasn't therapy, it wasn't counselling, uh, though I did speak to some different people. Um, and But they were just people that were able to listen to me, listen to my story and not kind of stick a scripture on it or do any mm. of those Christian things that are good and right to do in mm. their right moment and time. That's, I mean, listening to what you were saying carefully in the beginning there, you said that when the alcoholism reduced, that's when yes. the problems seemed to increase. Oh, yes. Because the alcoholism in itself can be, that's a sticking plaster on top of the real issue sometimes, isn't it? It re definitely is. I think almost anything can become an addiction. And part of that's because of, like, just our own human desires. We want mm. what we want. Mm. <laughs> but for the majority of people, those addictions that we cannot get out of... Mm that we are stuck in is because there's a place inside of us that's stuck somewhere unhappy. Mm. And rather than let that unhappiness to the surface, we keep it mm. down with alcohol, drugs, religion, the gym, nightclubbing, it, shopping. It can be absolutely anything. Even mm. good things mm. can become a hiding place away from our own pain. <sighs> That's really cool. I really get that. I'll tell you what, you've got a, a journey as well of your own in terms of your credentials and, and working mm. within a professional environment. We'll just take a break for some music, Tracy. That's a great intro and a brilliant potted um, explanation, if I may say. And we'll come back and hear more from you right after this. Cool. Tracy, you've um, really kindly unpacked a little bit of your own journey, and that's mm. really helpful for now. And I know we could talk for hours on mm. this, and you've got no problem doing that, but in the confines of an interview, um, as well as your, the authenticity of your own journey, um, you've also got professional qualifications, degrees mm. and experience. Unpack a little bit of, of that for us. Okay. Um, well, I hadn't done much with my life before. My original career was working with horses. 
um, which just seems like somebody else's life now. It's so long ago. I think if I got on one now, I'd get on one side and fall off the other. Um, <coughs> but it was the ideal place for me to work to keep drinking and use some drugs. Mm. Nobody expected too much. Everybody's very laid back. Anyway, as I moved along, um, one of the places that I went to for some help and support was a local charity called Salt Southwest. Um, it's a Christian charity, and the SALT stands for Sexual Abuse Listening Therapy. Mm -hmm. So I access there as a service user. And just over time, they saw something in me uh, that can only have come from God because I certainly didn't see it. Uh, so I became a team member quite quickly. And that's taught me so much over the years, the things God has shown me mm. for myself and for others. Um, so from there, uh, one day while I was at work there, uh, I had done a little bit of training at Plymouth University to become an adult tutor because um, mm. teaching is my thing. It even was in mm. the horsey world. Mm. Um, so God pulled that through into my walk with him. Uh, so I had done qualified as an adult tutor mm. and done a fair bit of work in that around the city, helping people, again, look at their own um, defences and emotions and stuff. Um, uh, but one day at work at Salt, uh, this envelope turned up and it was addressed to me. Uh, how they knew that was my address, I don't know. Anyway, it was from Plymouth University inviting me to apply for a degree in mental health nursing. Um, and I thought, oh, they've got the wrong person. I, this is just a laugh. Uh, me doing a degree, seriously. I've got nothing to my name. Um, but anyway, I went for the interview, got the place on the spot, um, largely because of my personal experience, mm. I think. And I kind of challenged the system a little bit. <laughs> and they liked that, they thought. Um, so I started the degree, all went terribly wrong, um, purely because of the, on any nursing programme, everybody gets to have um, occupational health, I think it is. You have to make sure your injections and stuff are up to date and you're fit mm. for practice. Um, and the guy who I was allocated to in Exeter um, would not believe that I was as well as I was having been as unwell as I was, and I wasn't on any medication. Mm -hmm. So he did a controlled urine test and thought I felt like a prisoner. The toilet was taped down and I had to have someone watching me. Um, and the, in, ultimately, he phoned me one day and said, I'm going to report to the university that I don't think you're fit for practice because I'm very suspicious that you're buying drugs off the internet or off the street wow. because you cannot be as well as you are having been as ill as you were. So I got pulled out of uni in front of 300 students in a lecture and escorted off the premises, uh, which was really wow. not. It triggered every ounce of shame I had left in my body. So I got a year to deal with that and I thought, I'm done. I, I don't ever want to go back there. I'm not, I can't do a degree anyway. I'm Tracy White, for goodness sake. Um, and 10 months later, God said, I want you to go back. Mm. And that, it was very clear so we had a little discussion about that, <laughs> like you do. And I did go back. And three years later, it was one of the hardest things I've ever done um, to be back in a psychiatric unit that I was in as a patient, uh, to be back there as a professional, were probably one of the biggest challenges I've ever faced. Mm. And seeing it then from the outside in, whilst also knowing what it's like from the inside out. Mm. And it was very, very challenging for me. But I came out of it with a first class honours degree and an award for most capable practitioner. Mm. And um, only God can do that journey with mm. somebody. Only God can take you from being as deranged as I was, and that was a word my doctor used, uh, to holding those pieces of paper in your hand and thinking, wow, Lord, look what you did. Mm. Um, so that's how I got that. And lots of experience since working in the mental health arena as a mental health nurse, um, as well as before that, working on different levels um, as a mental health practitioner in various capacities. Yeah. Lots of bits of work with psychologists in the system and yeah. trying to get the system to change a little bit. Just pick up a little bit on what you'd said earlier. I mean, I've, I've heard the story before, so mm. I was hoping you'd bring it out. And we didn't prime you for it or anything, yeah. Honest, honestly, <laughs> listeners. It um, really didn't. <laughs> but that... that 
part where the director or whoever he was that assessed you and said, look, I, I have to just say I'm suspicious that you're getting medication online illegally because yeah. you cannot possibly be well considering how unwell you were. Mm. I mean, that's going to speak to the rest of what you're bringing out. But that yeah. is a, it's very difficult in church circles and in a secular environment for people yeah. to actually believe in a genuine transformation, isn't it? It really is. It really is. And I, <clears throat> I met with that in church repeatedly. Mm. And I have to say, if it wasn't for the small bunch of people at Salt, I, I wouldn't be here now. Mm. But, and I know it's all God. I yep. absolutely honour God. Mm. I'm not giving any of them the glory. I give God all the glory. Mm. But I give them honour yep. for the places they were willing to stand and the places they were willing to sit in with me in my muck and the mire of some really grim, horrible, dirty stuff. Mm. Um. But that's what did it. Well, look, I think that's that's really why we're here today. I think that the authenticity of that journey and that story and the professional side of what you've got and what mm. you're bringing into the city now after mm. decades of working in this is really what we're about today. There's a genuine hope in this story yeah. um, for people in um, brokenness that would be labelled as mental illness, yeah. um, that there is a real, genuine living hope. And I think that's what we're going to come to. So yeah. we're going to, um, like I said, folks, a bit of a different journey uh, than Community Matters normally is. But obviously, if this isn't about the community, I don't know what is, considering more than 25% of the community are diagnosed with mental ill health. So mm. um, we'll come back and hear some more from Tracy right mm. after this. Tracy, let's um, let's unpack a little bit more. We've just come out of a, or you've just come out of a weekend conference, a Saturday conference. Conference, probably not the right word. I was mm. fortunate enough to be able to attend. Um, reframing mental illness uh, within that context. Mm. Unpack a little bit about that. Mm. Okay, um, uh, it's the fulfilment of thirty years of waiting for the Lord to fulfil a word He gave me thirty years ago. So just incredible uh, to be running that out on that day. But I like the title that you've used. It, the whole thing was about reframing mental illness for the church uh, because my hope and my dream, my passion is that the church understands actually what mental illness is all about. The vast majority, at least 97% of mental illness is not about there being anything wrong with anybody. It's about what's happened to you. Mm. And, and you're saying that as a mental health practitioner, as would be called in, in most circles. It's yeah. not just a guess. It's not just a, a faith statement. It's This is grounded in research, proper stuff mm. that you're doing. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Um, I had the opportunity when I was doing my degree to research the background and um, evidence, what's being, what, what is called evidence, that mental illness is either genetic or there's something to do with the brain and the hormones and... Um, and I discovered that actually, to my surprise, there is no pure scientific evidence for that. I don't want to go on about that too much today because I realise that's a challenge for a lot of mm. people. It was a challenge for me. Um, so it, that's part of what helped set me about, OK, Lord, what else is this? What, what, what is it then? Mm. And that was part of beginning my journey of looking a bit deeper in me uh, around that question of what's happened to you, not what's wrong with you. Um so, yes, it's it's based on fact that's acknowledged and recognised. So that's what this day was about, really, was using some different words about our stuck places mm. on the inside. We used a set of nesting dolls. I think most people might know them as Russian dolls and took them apart to show that mm. if, if in your adult life you are struggling with, um, I don't know, authority, it kicks you off into an anger rage and you don't really know why and you're mm. struggling with it... Um, then it's that God would go for the root because he's a roots and shoots kind of guy. Um, so if that started, if you look down the nesting dolls when you were a teenager, then that's where God would want to minister to because he's outside of time and space. Um, so allowing that place to bring into the here and now, it's not about regression. It's about allowing that place as an adult into the here and now with all truth and honesty because God desires truth in the innermost being. Mm. And to get truth into the innermost being, the innermost being needs healing to make space for the truth. Um, so that the day, people loved the reframing of language mm. and talking about our stuck places or our frozen places mm. that are stuck in time and space somewhere. Mm. Um, and people loved, sorry, Ian, no. but people loved the uh, idea when I spoke about 
lots of scriptures that talk about you've been given a spirit of love, power and a sound mind and you have the, the mind of Christ and the joy, the overflowing joy that we're supposed to experience in Christ, no matter what the circumstances, Paul said. Um, but when I said, actually, there is no caveat to any of these scriptures, there's nothing in brackets after any of them that says, unless you're mentally ill. Mm. And and that just begins to open up the, ah, oh, actually, that's true. Why shouldn't I have that? And how do I get that? Yeah. Now, just to be clear here, because I know you're really sensitive about this, we're not about um, knocking any kind of practice. We're not yeah. about saying anything against any other kind of practice or anything. What we're saying here is that you've, you know, you're in the journey of professionalism and lived experience, and yeah. lived experience with many others. Um, look about offering something that has some hope with it as well because there are the tools out there cbt i know has been an incredibly helpful tool for yeah. some people there's a lot of things that are yeah. helpful um and you're just adding something into the mix of that that's got a layer of authenticity is that a good word for what you're talking about yes definitely i think that's where it, it falls for people is it scratches where they itch mm. and uh, i absolutely the people in the mental health system are some of the most amazing people I've ever met in my life and they all want to make a difference. And actually that system is, in many ways, doing better than the church at recognising how you are now um, is to do with this thing, this trauma, this distress, this loss, that's unfinished business. The world is better at recognising that than the church is quite often. Why do you think that is? Put you on the spot. I think the church is a little bit afraid, really, of the mess that comes with acknowledging our mess. Mm. My, my mess is, it was mucky mess to sit in. It wasn't pleasant to listen to. It wasn't pleasant to cope with and deal with. People didn't necessarily know what to say to me, but they sat with me in my mucky mire mm. until I was ready to get out. And, and being ready to get out was about when I got to the end of my muck and mire. Mm. And then each time I was allowed to do that, I thought, right, I'm getting out of here now. Um, now I want something else in here because that's all gone. But so where the, where the world stops in the mental health system is that we will give you management tools because we recognise that this unfinished business in life has affected your mental health and that's why you've got this diagnosis. Um, so we'll give you tools to manage that and you'll need them for the rest of your life. So... This stuff, and that's fabulous, it's a starting place to help stabilise people. But what God wants to do is go to the roots and get the cause healed completely so that the chains are completely broken. The suicidality, the self-harm, all that stuff is actually stops. We don't ever want to do it again. Let's pick up on that right after this next track, Tracy. We're back and hear more from this from Tracy uh, right after this. And we'll give out some contact details later if this interview touches anything uh, for yourself. Uh, we'll have some contact details where you can uh, find a little bit more support. We'll be back with you right after this. Tracy, I know from um, talking with you um, that you've got examples, um, a plenty of people who've uh, um, not only had their... Um, thought processes that seem hugely irrational mm. given a grounding in reality of oh that's why that's there mm. um also people who've um come through into a, a position of peace and and, and healing and mm. being made whole um but and we can't unpack all of that in the five minutes mm. we've got here but what do, you, what do you think would be helpful for our listeners to hear that you could share um i guess for now i was just thinking I can't for the life of me remember the name of the book, but I'll do my best to in case any of the listeners want to get a copy. Um, so it's a book that was published about a guy's life story. Uh, and this guy was diagnosed with schizophrenia and he was building an ant home in his lounge. So he was using plastic milk cartons and putting dirt in them and bringing ants in and his whole flat was a complete mess and it was taken to be part of his schizophrenia. Um, and after years of being on medication for that and in and out of hospital, um, someone just said to him, what does this mean to you? What, 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 this is so meaningful. What's it about for you? And he'd never been asked that question before. And he told the whole story instantly of when he was much younger. He was responsible for his younger disabled brother. They used to go out to play. <coughs> I think the guy in the book was 
10 or 11 at the time, and his younger disabled brother fell in a river. Mm. And this 10, 11-year-old boy, as he was then, did his best to rescue him, uh, but he couldn't, and his younger brother passed away. Mm. And the whole book, we f you found out at the end, um, was around his, his little brother. Always used to say to Mum repeatedly, can I have one of those ants' nests from the pet shop? They were like little boxes that people used to keep ants mm. in and stuff. And Mum always used to say no. So this thing in this guy's lounge was an homage to his brother out of his guilt. Mm. Now, the end of the book is they realised that that's what it was, so they let him do it and they carried on giving him the medication. And I thought, oh, would I would love to be able to get my hands on that guy and use a, there's some tools that you can use with journaling, different tools, not just straightforward journaling. Um, and the nesting dolls I mentioned earlier are really helpful, some sand tray stuff. And it's not about being a therapist. We don't have to be therapists. But to help him resolve his guilt mm. would mean that all of that stuff in that lounge could probably go. He wouldn't need it anymore. Because if he could work out in relationship with someone, just listening to him, um, he'd be able to let go of the guilt. Mm -hmm. And it's as simple as that. How important would you say in the journey towards genuine wholeness in this is an experiential encounter with God? Or is this something that's open for people who would say, I don't even believe in God. I'm not sure I'm there with that. Mm -hmm. Um, what I know and what I see is both in my own life and in the lives of others who I've had the privilege of walking alongside, people who know Jesus actively and walk with him, the healing process happens more quickly because they, in between their chats with me, and that is all we do is we chat and God gives me some ideas for them. That's it. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a qualified therapist. But they then take that away and they do a lot of it with Jesus as they go. They talk with him about it and he tells them little bits to do here and there. So it does go more quickly. But uh, like at Salt, for instance, and my heart's desire for the church is that the church gets equipped with remembering that this is about relationship. It's not about being therapists um, mm. because it's not therapy when we just talk about our lives and share our lives properly in depth without putting any sticky plasters on it. it. When we just do that in the church, one day, sometime soon, hopefully, the doors are going to be wide open for anybody of any faith, the same faith or no faith, just mm. to come and knock on the door and say, can I have some of what you've got, please? Mm. And the answer is a resounding yes every time. Because if people with no faith or a different faith come to Christians who are filled with the Holy Spirit, people will have to look in the book of Acts in the Bible to pick up on that one, then they're coming to God anyway, not because we are not God, mm. but the Holy Spirit in us is God and he counsels us mm. while we counsel others in the mm. loosest term of counsel. Yeah, there's that beautiful passage in Corinthians, either one or two, so go look it up for yourselves, folks. Um, the God of all comfort, comfort you so that you may comfort others Wonderful. with the same comfort you yourself have received. It's yeah. like giving away what you've been given, recognising yeah. we're all on a similar journey. Absolutely. Um, I interrupted you now, so I've interrupted your flow. I'm awfully sorry. The, there's, I mean, there's an authenticity in what you're saying and a reality in that. And, and I know from listening to you for a, a while and, and getting to hear about you and hearing about you from others, my mm. wife for one, um, could you deliver training in the city? It isn't just some idea you've cooked up in your quiet time in your front room, is it? This is There's decades of experience here, Tracy. I mean, unpack a little. I mean, SALT, sexual abuse listening therapy, that's adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse you've been working with, yeah? Yes, it is. Uh, so that charity is on you, based on Union Street. Mm. Um, and like I said, it's a Christian-based charity. Um, and that's part of the name, really, SALT. Mm. We are, the Bible says that we are the salt of the earth. Um, and people can have a great time going and researching all the things that SALT does. Mm. Um, uh, and it's just, that's been going for 38 years now, that yeah. charity. And how long have you been involved there? Oh, 30, blah, 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 something right. like that. <laughs> I just wanted to get that nugget out to say that there's, there's decades of lived experience walking alongside people with very deep issues. Yeah. This isn't a just, oh, this is the latest idea off the shelf of ideas for counselling. Uh, no, absolutely not. It's very... Or lots of the services in the city, mental health services send mm. people to us. 
um, eating disorders send people to us, the ambulance people, it, it's mm. everybody sends people to us. And I have to say, I have the privilege of privilege of working with a God created team of people from whom I learn so much. That is a good place to stop and maybe come back to that team and maybe come back to how people can uh, access help in, in different ways mm. as well for themselves. So we'll take a break. We'll be back with Tracy right after this. Tracy, this is um, the kind of topic that we could be talking about for hours and hours and hours. And probably I'm thinking you need to get onto Life Stories with Dave or Art of Living with Chris or something because it's a, you know, there's a much more in-depth conversation here. Mm. And um, it's something very relevant in the church particularly, yeah. um, but not just in the church, also to just about anybody who's listening. Yeah. Um, we've touched on the event that happened on the 29th. Yeah. Um, where a number of people gathered to hear about this and experience mm. some of these these thoughts and, and the teaching that you bring on this. Mm. Um, what was the feedback like from that day? Well, the feedback was pretty amazing. Um, so most of it around how we managed to create a safe space for people, mm. um, just to be with themselves. Um, and uh, we 34 people were signed up. And 59 came. <laughs> so it, it was a little bit like, OK, this is great. Uh, we had people say that it's the first time they've ever felt safe enough to come and ask for ministry. And they've been in the church for years. I think there really is some stuff for the church to reflect on and think about what are we doing. Um, but there was lots of feedback around the how amazing it was to reframe the words from mental illness to some of those other ones we talked about earlier, like our stuck places and unfinished business and um, that kind of stuff. Uh, lots of requests for in future, can we have some tools to use, please, for ourselves? And there were some people there who wanted tools to use with others. Um, uh, we're not going to do that, we, the, uh, this approach that is used. And I, I just, can I just say, the tools are not therapy tools. They're tools just to help people bring stuff to the surface in the here and now. Mm. It, mm. It's just because we can be quite resistant when mm. stuff's been pushed down for years and years. So that's all the tools do is help people lift it, let it come to the surface mm. so that we can then process it mm. um, and it gets to an end mm. at last. Um, and from a, a faith perspective, we'll be saying that um, prayer and um, the involvement of Holy Spirit in our lives, bringing healing is, is quite key there. Um, and I know from what you said on the day, you'd share the same as me. God can, would like to heal some of his children, even if they don't think he's healing them. You don't, it's not exclusively for Christians. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. Um, we Certainly at SALT, um, and I know this is not all about SALT, it's a wider thing for anything. Mm. So just to be clear, at SALT, the access is for adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse. But this stuff that we're talking about today is for any unfinished business. Um, any unresolved trauma, distress or anything. Could you just, um, there's a lot of work going on in Plymouth at the minute around trauma, which I think is great. I hear that from mm. my wife who's involved in it, got her fingers in a bazillion pies. Um, but could you unpack a little bit what that means, unfinished business, un bus unfinished business unresolved trauma? Because it doesn't have to be this hugely disastrous thing happened in my past, does it? Mm. No, absolutely. It's any unfinished business. So the references I made earlier on to the guy who was diagnosed with schizophrenia and building the ant nest, his unfinished business was unresolved guilt. It, it, that guilt needed resolving mm. to set him free, to completely free him from the drive and the need to, to build mm. that in his room for yeah. his brother. And that just took one person being aware enough to ask him a question. That's right. And that person wasn't a therapist. No, no. <laughs> So come back again. You've had this event on the 29th. The feedback's been positive um, by mm. the sound of it. People have found a safe space. And mm. um, any plans for the future? Definite plans for the future. And that was one of the key um, elements of feedback, that people loved the teaching and the looking at the reframing of language and how we understand uh, mental illness and mm. mental health. Um, and people wanting to know what, how to do it, how to get the unfinished business finished at last mm -hmm. rather than keeping needing prayer all the time so we have set up some workshops we're a fabulous team it's not just me um, <coughs> and I am just so 
privilege to be working alongside Phil and Jean Walsh in this as well, a couple who have been in the city for many, many years. And it's their fault because they started this like 30, 25, 30 years ago. It's all their fault. Um, so we've got some workshops and they're going to be on the last Saturday of the month for September, October, November, and then January, February, March. Um, and they're all venue undecided as of yet, but people can put the dates in their diaries. I've got the exact dates if you want me to give those out. Um, last Saturday in the month is pretty pretty good. I think people should get that. Okay. And um, we can, if people, if what people want to find out the dates and um, we haven't said them, they can either email studio at crossrhythms.co, no, studio at crplymouth.co.uk and we'll put them in touch with you. Um, or I'm sure you could give us some contact details maybe at the end of the uh, of this yep. interview. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's um, the last Saturday of every month. And who's that open to? It's open to anybody. Anybody who wants to come, as long as people are open to using the tools, we're going to bring some tools and get this thing moving on. Mm. Um, so we're going to bring some tools. There'll be tables and chairs and small groups. So people need to come ready to be a little bit vulnerable at their table, not in the whole room, just at their table, and start to learn how to use some of the tools. And we have seen in SALT... God will pour out his healing for any who come. You don't have to be a Christian. You don't have to be anything at all. Um, you just come with an open heart, ready to apply it to yourself. They're not tools that you can pick up and use to do to another person uh, without having done to yourself first. That's the key. Mm. Now, I know from... Um Oh, I hope she doesn't mind me saying this. Um, from Karen's experience, my wife, because she did some training with you and the mm. role that she's involved in, that touched some uh, nerves in her and she found it incredibly beneficial mm. in some uh, unfinished business of her own. And, mm. and I know her. It's just she's a very competent person. She's out there functioning Absolutely. and doing an amazing job everywhere, mm. um, not least of which putting up with me. So, <laughs> but she, and the the benefit of that just seems to accrue and to accrue and to accrue. And mm. we're not talking about rocket science. We're not talking about <laughs> dramatic, are we, necessarily? Absolutely, absolutely. It doesn't need to be dramatic. It's for people who may have been bullied one day at school when they were eight, but it was particularly humiliating. They had no one to go home and talk to about it. So it got shut down on the inside. Mm. That's unfinished business. Yep. Um, and the same tools that we use to bring that, it's really important. Those things can grow and they get, it's like a snowball that starts tiny, but as it rolls downhill, gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So mm. something that people consider tiny like that from might be 40, 50 years ago for some people, as it's rolled through life, it's got bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm. Um, and that can result in all sorts of diagnoses. Mm. So it can be the loss of a really dearly loved pet when you were five. I, it doesn't. It could be something from five years ago, you know, a really marked um, acrimonious divorce or something that you've been desperately hurt and you've shoved it all down. Mm. So it's a. It's more about unfinished business, yep. emotional business, than it is about what the thing was. I love where you're going with this, and it sounds great. We're going um, towards the end of the interview time that we've mm. got, Tracy, which is a shame. Um, there have been a number, number of conversations on Community Matters over the years, um, just airing the conversation around mental health. Mm. That's, been, that's been a plus. And it feels to me that this is now going, OK, now we're happy talking. Mm. Let's start looking underneath that mm. label, and let's look at some things that can be helpful in resolving. And it sounds really simple. Um, but it would do if you're basing it on 30 odd plus years of lived experience and experience with other people. So mm. thanks for all you're doing. Um, can you give us some contact info, how people can get in touch to find out more about coming to some of these workshops? Yes, absolutely. So the uh, um, advert will be going out soon. Uh, I'll put it in various different places for people to save the date. Um <coughs> So I think you are going to give some contact details where people can contact you here. Mm -hmm. um, but also if people are interested and they don't see the advert in the next month somewhere, um, then they can email Light in the Darkness Plymouth at outlook dot 
Com. Com. I want to say. I'm going to say. <laughs> okay. I will double check that. It's a yeah. new one set up purposely okay. for this. Okay. So I will double check that and give it to you so that you can put it on the cross rhythms thing so people can then double check it with you. That's great, Tracy. Well, listen, if you're listening to this live, uh, don't forget to check us out on the Listen Again feature on the website. I'm just aware we're running out of time. If you are watching it for the first time on our website, great. Go back and rewatch it. Check the show notes because we'll have some details in there about how you can contact uh, Tracy. But at the moment, we're going with light in the darkness at outlook.com. And um, we're hoping that's right. If it's not, Light we'll in the darkness, it. Plymouth. Light in the darkness, Plymouth. There we go. I've already got it wrong at outlook.com. Um, Tracy, thank you ever so much for coming in. Really appreciate your uh, time and uh, your vulnerability and openness. Uh, thank you for the opportunity and everybody out there. Take care. That's great. Uh, you're listening to Cross Rhythms 96.3 FM and online. This has been Community Matters. Stay tuned for more great music and life all day.